Yeah. Okay. So uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for coming along. I've been uh, really enjoying these webinars and additive chromatorics. So I'm uh, very happy to talk here. I apologize in advance about my laziness at not sending through a title and abstract. Um, but for the avoidance of doubt, I'm going to be talking about the Fersenberg Sarkozy theory. Uh, so if this doesn't appeal to you, I won't hold it against you if you decide to leave now. Um, but uh, so the basic question that I'd like to think about today is a question that was first posed by Lavash, which is if I take some subset of the natural numbers that has the property that it has no square differences, then how dense a set can I possibly have? So by no square differences, I just mean that there's no solutions to a minus b equals n squared, where a and b are both integers from my set a, and n squared is just any positive square. So I guess by no square differences, I mean no non-zero square differences. Um, so there's only the trivial solutions in the different set, which are squares. Um, and the reason for Lavash's question is that I assume he was expecting that it to be um, impossible for a set to have positive density and simultaneously no square differences. And this is indeed the case, and it was um, proven independently by Furstenberg and Sarkozy. So um, you can just think about the finite analog, which is what I'm going to concentrate on today. And if A is some subset of the first n positive integers, and it has no square differences, then um, A can't be a positive density subset. So as n grows, uh, the density of A on 1 up to n has to tend to 0. So the size of A is little o of capital N. Um, so Fersenberg and Sarkozy both proved this result um, around the same time, but using rather different methods. So Fersenberg uh, used an ergodic approach, whereas uh, Sarkozy's approach was much more Fourier analytic. Um, and by now, I think there's several different means of proving the Fersenberg Sarkozy. Uh, theorem, but what I want to focus today is on not just this um, qualitative bound little o of n, but really to try and work out how dense A can be, and so I want quantitative bounds. Um, and then it turned out that Sarkozy's argument, this very analytic argument, uh, did naturally give a quantitative bounds, and it showed that um, essentially any subset of one up to n, which has no square differences, must have size at most n divided by log n to the power one third. Um, so he got this explicit quantitative bound for the maximum size of a uh, set of integers in one up to n with no square differences. Um, and what I really want to focus on today is. Uh, to what extent can this quantitative bound of Sarkozy be improved upon? So hopefully the question that I'm interested in is reasonably clear. And the Fersenberg Sarkozy theorem has led to quite a lot of work over time in additive chromatorics, both improving, both proving different generalizations of the theorem, but also uh, proving stronger results. And the key result that I want to mention here is um, a result of Pintz, Steiger, and Semmeredi that improves the quantitative nature of Sarkozy's bound. So this result of Pintz, Steiger, Semmeredi says that if A is a subset of one up to N that has no square differences, then the size of A is bounded by N divided by log N to some growing power where the power grows like a quadruple iterated logarithm of n. So 
I'm an analytic number theorist. And so of course I have to have lots and lots of logs everywhere. And so this is the first appearance of a quadruple iterated algorithm in my talk. Um, and so this is improving on Sarkozy's theorem because we replaced the exponent of log n from one third to this uh, quadruple log n, which is now growing faster than any constant. And maybe the most interesting qualitative feature of this result in my mind is that it does noticeably better than the best bounds known in the proof of Roth's theorem. So um, in Roth's theorem, there's a natural barrier in, from the point of view of the methods of size around n over log n. This has been this recent work through recent work of Bloom and CSASC, who've uh, improved that to n divided by log n to some constant slightly bigger than one. Um, but for these problems, where instead of looking at three term arithmetic regressions, you're looking for differences that are equal to a square, we can get notably sparser results that go well beyond any barrier of n over log n. And this is despite the fact that um, you can prove both results in fundamentally a fairly similar style using a Fourier analytic density increment argument. Um, so the reason that we're able to do better here is that we're able to um, exploit some special structure in the squares. Um, and in the opposite direction, uh, what's a lower bound for the maximum density. Um, so it was conjectured originally by Erdos that um, perhaps any set subset of one up to n that has no square differences should have size close to the square root of n. Uh, but this was disproved by Imre Rouge, um, who showed that there is a set of um, one up to n that has no square differences and a has size n to the power 0 0.73, roughly. He had a more precise version for the exponent and the exponent has been improved slightly since by Luco. Um, but that's the best known construction for a set with no square differences. Um, and I guess it should be mentioned that we do believe uh, the optimal answer in this problem should be rather different to that of Roth's theorem. So there's nothing that we know of that corresponds to say the Berend construction for uh, very dense sets with no three term arithmetic progressions. And so I think the experts believe that the true density um, for this Persenberg Sarkozy problem should be that the maximal density of a set of uh, a subset of one up to n should be of size n to the power c for some constant c less than one. And I find this a very interesting and appealing problem, even though I don't know how to solve it at all. But I guess maybe it is worth mentioning that the um, equivalent result of this over function fields. Um, that you have a power saving bound um, is known thanks to the work of Green, building on the earlier breakthroughs of uh, Krupner Pack and Ellenberg Gijewit on Ross theorem over finite fields. Okay, so hopefully everyone's reasonably happy with what the problem that I want to look at today is just the density of sets that have no square differences. And everyone's reasonably happy with the state of play. Um, the best upper bound being this result of Finch, Steiger, Semerady, and the best lower bound being this result of Rouge. Um, and the main result that I'd like to talk about today then is joint work with Tom Bloom from Cambridge, where we um, improve the upper bound uh, for set, subsets of one up to n that have no square differences. And so we're getting a better quantity bound than uh, Pint, Steiger, and Semmady. And our result shows that any set a, subset A of one up to n with no square differences has size at most n divided by log n to some power that grows slowly. But now we have a triple iterated logarithm rather than a quadruple iterated logarithm in the exponent. Um, so log, 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 n grows slightly faster 
than log, 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 log n. Uh, and therefore, this is a stronger upper bound, even if um, maybe um, in some qualitative sense, the uh, improvements only rather small. Um, but there's two things that I'd like to mention straight off the bat about this result. Um, so uh, although there's certainly there's similarities between the Pintz, Steiger, Sam Rady argument and our arg argument, and we are making use about our explicit knowledge about when the squares can have large Fourier coefficients to be able to produce an argument that goes beyond the uh, limitations of our techniques in say Roth's theorem or something like that. Um, we like to think at least that our argument is slightly simpler than theirs and is a bit more direct, a bit more of a direct way of approaching the problem. Uh, and the second thing that I'd like to emphasize right now is that the maybe the key difference in our work compared to previous work is an explicit way of quantifying maybe the phrase that rationals with small denominators, at least when these denominators are different from one another, have little additive structure. And it's using a result about um, rationals with small denominators having little additive structure, um, which enables us to improve the um, Fourierianic density increment argument. But I think both of me and Tom are maybe optimistic that there might be other applications of this sort of basic idea that whenever you have um, sets of rationals with small denominators, so the sorts of things that appear in the traditional major arcs in the hardy little circle method, um, you might be able to use the fact that they have little additive structure in some other related problems in say additive combinatorics. Um, so this idea about rationals having uh, little additive structure is maybe one that would be useful in other areas and so it's maybe of independent interest. So um, our second result is to do with the additive and is a way of quantifying this um, by talking about the additive energy of sets of rationals with small denominators. Um, so I'm sure most of the audience here are very familiar with this and rather more familiar with it than me. Um, but let's recall that the k-fold additive energy is just the set of some set. So choose your favorite set A, then E2k of A is the number of 2k tuples, A1 up to A2k, such that A1 plus A2 plus A3 up to plus AK is equal to AK plus one plus AK plus two up to A2k. So it's the number of pairs of k tuples which are equal to one another. And trivially, if you give me a1 up to ak, I can just choose ak plus one to be equal to a1, ak plus two to be equal to a2, and so on, which gives me a lower bound for the 2k fold additive energy of a as being the size of a to the power k, because that's the number of ways of choosing a1 up to ak. And a totally trivial upper bound is the size of a to the power 2k because I'm just looking at 2k tuples a1 up to a2k um, in a. And one should think of if I'm closer to the lower bound then I'm saying my set a has little additive structure because there's few solutions to these additive equations whereas if I'm closer to the upper bound then it's saying that my set a has lots of additive structure um, and I'm expecting maybe my set to look somewhat similar to um, very additively structured sets of integers like um, intervals or arithmetic progressions. And then this um, sets of rationals having little additive structure, which I said just in very vague terms beforehand, uh, can be written more precisely in terms of this k-fold additive energy. So, um, I want to think of a set of rationals um, where all the denominators of rationals are at most q. So I guess throughout this talk, when I talk about the denominator of a rational, I mean uh, the denominator when it's written in lowest terms. 
Uh, so I'm looking at a set of rationals where all the denominators are integers between one and Q. And uh, I want to ensure that um, if you give me your favorite denominator, maybe a million, there's at most R rationals with that de given denominator. So there's at most R rationals with denominator a million, and most R rationals with denominator two million, and all of those denominators have to be of size at least Q. Um, so trivially, B is therefore a set of size at most QR, because there's at most Q different choices of the denominator, and at most um, R possible different rationals with the same denominator. And the conclusion is that the K fold or 2K fold additive energy of B, E2KB, is bounded above by QR to the power K times some logarithmic factor. So in particular, if B contains about R different uh, rationals for every given denominator Q um, that appears, and maybe a positive proportion of denominators Q appear, then B would be of size about the maximum possible Q times R. And in this case, this bound would be saying that the additive energy of B is bounded above by B to the power K times some logarithmic factor. And so the additive energy, this upper bound would actually be very close to the trivial lower bound. It would just differ by a logarithmic factor. Um, and so this would be saying that if I have um, a set that looks like this of uh, lots of rationals with denominators up to Q, where I have few elements of any given rational with any given denominator, then I have very little additive structure and the K fold additive energy is almost as small as it possibly can be. Um, you might think that this condition that there's at most R rationals with any given denominator, at first sight, maybe it looks slightly artificial, but um, if my set B consisted just of lots of lots, lots and lots of different rationals, all with the same denominator Q, then uh, essentially the fact that the rationals almost disappears and it's very easy to have um, sets B then, which would have lots of additive structure and so the additive energy would be very big. And so it's necessary to have some sort of condition that B can't be too concentrated on uh, rationals all with the same denominator. Uh, so hopefully uh, the second statement is reasonably clear to people as a way of quantifying this vague principle that rationals with different small denominators have small additive energy and so are um, additively not very structured in some quantitative sense. Um, okay, so I mentioned that this principle we hope might have other applications, which is why I'm writing it as a separate theorem. So just to give um, a small amount of evidence for that, um, there's some other recent work uh, just of mine about simultaneous Diophantine approximation with values of polynomials, so in particular with say squares. Um, uh, and so a statement of this result is if you choose your K favorite real numbers, then there's some integer n less than or equal to x, such that the fractional parts alpha i n squared are all bounded above by one over some, over one divided by x to the power, some constant over k um, for any choice of x large enough. And the key point here is that uh, the exponent of x decays like one over k, which is essentially best possible. So all previous results had decays maybe of the form uh, one over k squared or something, uh, whereas uh, this simultaneous Diophantine approximation result um, has at least the exponent in terms of in the k aspect being best possible. And this was a slightly different situation. It was a rather more structured setup but in this rather more structured setup, I was again 
using the fact that rationals with small denominators had little additive structure to be able to get a clear improvement over what happened before and to be able to get a density increment argument to work that gave essentially optimal bounds in this case. So this is a small proof of principle, um, although this was also relied on various arguments based on the geometry of numbers as well. Um, okay, maybe I should pause here and I should ask if there's any questions about uh, the main statements that I put up and the questions I'm looking at now. Okay, seeing no objections, I assume that everyone's very happy with what the problem is that I'm looking at and what the claim is that I've proven with Tom. And so I'd now like to move on to talk about some of the ideas that go into the proof of the result. Um, so before I dive into argument, um, argument is really fundamentally just a variation of Sarkozy's original argument. And so I'd like to recall um, maybe the most important steps in Sarkozy's original argument. So Sarkozy's original argument can be formulated at least as a Fourier analytic density increment argument, very much in the style of Roth's theorem. So you start off with the circle method um, and you can use Fourier analysis to count the number of square differences in a set A. And if A has no square differences, then A has a different number of square differences to what you might expect just based on density grounds. And it follows using the circle method that A must have various large non-trivial Fourier coefficients. Um, but similarly, from the circle method, uh, the squares must have simultaneously large Fourier coefficients. And we understand the Fourier coefficients of the squares very well. Um, so in particular, we know that the squares can only have large Fourier coefficients when uh, you're evaluating the Fourier transform, uh, maybe close to a rational with small denominator. And so in particular, it means that some of these large non-trivial Fourier coefficients of my set A must occur close to rationals and small denominator. Um, there's then the density increment step that once we've uh, found out that A must have a large Fourier coefficient close to a rational with small denominator, if it had a, say, a large Fourier coefficient with denominator Q, then we can find an arithmetic progression with modulus Q squared on which A has increased density. And moreover, by restricting just this arithmetic progression, we can find a subset which has no square differences, but increased density. And so then by dividing by three by Q squared, we find some uh, smaller set A primed contained in some smaller first initial interval one up to N primed, where A primed has increased density compared to A and still has no square differences. And so because we can pass from our original set to a self-similar situation, but with increased density, we can then just iterate this statement multiple times. But since densities can't get bigger than one, we must eventually uh, reach a contradiction if at least my uh, initial value n was large enough compared to the density of f. And then working this through quantitatively gives Sarkozy's argument that uh, a must have density, of, a can't possibly have density uh, bigger than uh, one over log n to the power one third. So this was maybe Sarkozy's original argument. And um, the key improvement that Tom and I make compared to Sarkozy's original argument is that we find structure in the set of large Fourier coefficients of A. And in particular, we find that there must be some single denominator Q with many large Fourier coefficients. 
And if there's lots of large Fourier coefficients of A with denominator Q, then we can improve this density increment step. And it's uh, this improvement that allows us to get an improvement in the um, overall density that comes out. So the pimp steiger samueli argument um, morally was doing something similar. It was also finding structure um, in the fact that you had lots of rationals and small denominators appearing in the large Fourier coefficients. And that's what we are very much relying on. But the way we go about um, finding this structure and insert it into the argument is slightly different to what they did before. So this is a summary of Sarkozy's original argument and maybe a summary of how we're modifying this argument to get an improved bound. Um, so I'd like to just go through this now in a little bit more quantitative detail. Um, and uh, <clears throat> by going through these quantitative lemmas, I want to try and show how the theorem that I mentioned before on bounding the up bounding the additive energy of rationals with small denominators can be useful in given a improved bound for the density of sets with no square differences. Um, so the first lemma, which is essentially completely standard and is just following um, maybe the original Sarkozy argument, um, can be formulated as uh, saying that there's <coughs> some set B of large Fourier coefficients of A, um, where all of these large Fourier coefficients uh, look like rationals with denominators of size about Q. And I have to quantify everything. So a large Fourier coefficient I'm saying is of size, uh, maybe the trivial bound is off from the trivial upper bound by a factor of capital B, and this set of rationals with small denominators, well, small denominators means that they all have size Q. And the fact that this is a large set, I'm saying it has size about Q to the half times D squared. So here we're not doing anything new at all. This is pretty standard for people who are familiar with these sorts of arguments. Um, I don't want to go into a huge amount of detail, but I thought I would include a three line sketch of how you produce a lemma like this, if you haven't seen it before. Um, so by the circle methods, we can count the number of solutions of A1 minus A2 is equal to a square. And we're assuming that this is equal to zero since A is a set with uh, no square differences. But using the circle method, I can write this as a um, Fourier integral involving the Fourier transform of my set A and the Fourier transform of the squares. But I know that the contribution um, of the integral when theta is very close to zero um, is given me roughly what one would expect if A was a completely random set. Um, and so the contribution when theta is close to zero is of size about a squared divided by n to the one half, which is what you'd expect if A was a completely random set. And so for this whole integral to be equal to zero, it means that the contribution when theta is not close to zero must counteract this contribution near zero. And so in particular, the total contribution when theta is not close to zero must be of size about A squared over n to the one half. I can then follow the standard circle method argument of splitting this integral up into major arcs, depending on the closest rational approximation to the value theta. And I can simply pick the size of denominators which gives the largest possible contribution. So I can restrict my attention to uh, when theta is well approximated by a rational with the denominator of size Q and <clears throat> this will give me a large proportion of the overall count from when theta is not equal to zero. But the point of doing this is that when theta is close to a rational with denominator Q, I understand the Fourier transform of the squares exceptionally well. I know that I save a factor of about 
one over q to the one half. And so if I substitute this in here and rearrange terms, I can use the pigeonhole principle again, and I get the lemma that I stated here, that there's some large set of rationals with small denominators when the Fourier transform of A is large. Um, it's not important to have followed all the details of the proof. Um, and at first reading, you shouldn't be paying too much uh, attention to the precise quantitative numbers, although they will be important later on. Um, okay, so what's the use of um, finding these uh, large Fourier coefficients close to rationals of small denominator? Well, if this set of rationals contained eta times b squared rationals with the same denominator q, so b was me measuring before what I what my definition of a big Fourier coefficient was, and eta here is some parameter that I'm just going to choose later on, but we should think of it as some small constant maybe. Um, then, so if I do find lots of rationals with the same denominator q, then I can guarantee that there's an arithmetic progression with difference q on which a has increased density. And uh, again, um, I'm not doing anything new here. This is well known to experts, but I thought I'd include a three line proof. So Parseval's identity just in discrete pre analysis says the variance of um, elements in my set in arithmetic progressions modulo Q is equal to the, uh, the uh, second moment of non-trivial Fourier coefficients uh, with, the, with denominators Q, essentially. So if I have lots of uh, large Fourier coefficients with denominator Q, that means the right-hand side is large, and that means that uh, the variance of elements in arithmetic progressions must be large. And from this, it follows that there must be some arithmetic progression where A has unusually many elements. <coughs> um, and if you work through this quantitatively, um, that shows that um, if you have uh, some small constant times B squared rationals with the same denominator Q in this set where I'm off by a factor B from the trivial bounds, then I get this density increment of a factor one plus eta squared. Um, and if I have a good density increment, then I can just keep on iterating this. So therefore the difficult situation is if B doesn't contain lots of rationals with the same denominator Q. Um, <clears throat> so this is just the standard Sarkozy situation. And the difficulty we're faced with is what happens if B has few elements with any given denominator? Um, so in Sarkozy's original argument, uh, rather than relying on lots of rationals with the same denominator Q. Essentially, he only needed one rational with denominator Q. So he was choosing eta to essentially be of size one over B squared. And then you get a um, density increment of size about one over B to the four. Um, and if you, you get some control on the size of B based on the density of A, and then iterating that gave him his argument. But if we want to improve this, we're going to try and make use of the fact that we want to find some de single denominator Q that has lots of different rationals all with the same denominator. Um, and so the situation that we're faced with is what happens if we have a fairly large set, but for any individual denominator, there's not too many points with that denominator. But that's precisely the situation where we have our additive energy bounds. So, I can apply our additive energy bound theorem to say that um, in this difficult situation that we need to handle if we want to get an improvement, I have the additional information that my set of large Fourier coefficients of A must have little additive energy and so must have little additive structure. Um, 
Okay, so we've now used our theorem to deduce that A must have little additive structure amongst its many large Schroeder coefficients, all with small denominators, but it's not clear that how this automatically helps us. But I'd like to now recall a um, important result in additive combinatorics, uh, which is um, Chang's dilemma that roughly says that if you have a fairly dense set A, then its set of large Schroeder coefficients must have additive structure. So uh, at least formulated uh, quantitatively in uh, our situation, Chang's lemma says that if I take any dissociated subset of my set of large Schroeder coefficients, uh, then uh, this subset must not be too large, where not be too large can be bounded in terms of this quantity capital B, which is measuring how large the Schroeder coefficients are, and the density of A. Um, so uh, maybe I don't want to precisely formulate it um, in uh, <coughs> uh, right now, but morally you can think of dissociated sets as roughly uh, sets where the only solutions to A1 plus dot 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 plus AK is equal to AK plus one up to A2K are trivial ones where the set A1 up to AK is equal to the set AK plus one up to A2K. So the actual definition is slightly different from that, but it's morally very close to that. And so Chang's lemma is saying that you can't have large, very, very additively unstructured sets in uh, your set of large Fourier coefficients. So dissociated sets are maybe um, a very extreme version of sets with little additive structure. Now, unfortunately, in our situation, uh, we don't, we aren't quite in this situation. We know that our set B um, consists only of rationals with small denominator, and we know that there's few solutions to a. Uh, maybe B1 up to BK is equal to BK plus one up to B2K from our additive energy bound, but we don't know that they're only the trivial solutions. So we can't use Chang's lemma just off the bat, but a small variant of Chang's lemma that essentially follows from a minor variation on the proof of Chang's lemma uh, allows us to instead say that for any subset of a set of large Fourier coefficients, you can bound the size of the subset in terms of the additive energy of that subset. Uh, I guess to be a little bit more precise, uh, you need some approximate additive energy where you have um, k-fold sums being close to one another. But now this is almost precisely um, what we wanted that um, by just modifying the proof of Chang's lemma slightly, we can say that any subset of our set of rationals and small denominators um, cannot be large if it has little additive structure. So I guess, again, I think I'll give a three line proof of the variant of Chang's lemma, um, just so that you get a feeling of what it is. But if you know the proof of Chang's lemma, you probably already know how to do this. Um, I want to, I'll first choose constants CB of modulus one, just to make all the um, Fourier coefficients all point in the same direction. So I want uh, CB times the Fourier coefficient of A at B to just be a positive number. And then since I know that all of these Fourier coefficients are large, I know that um, for every uh, B in my set of large Schroeder coefficients. So certainly for all Bs in my set lambda, um, I have that CB times the Fourier coefficient of A at B is bigger than the size of A divided by capital B. So that gives me my first inequality of um, the size of lambda times the size of the Fourier coefficients is bounded above by this sum over all elements of lambda of these uh, weighted Fourier coefficients, but then I can just expand the definition of the Fourier transform as 
uh, the sum of all elements of A um, with the phase e to the 2 pi i A times B. I then just swap the order of summation and apply Holder's inequality to say that this is bounded above by the 2 kth moment of the sum over all phases B in my subset lambda of some exponential sum involving these coefficients CB. And then I can just upper bound the sum over all elements of my set A by maybe a smooth majorant for uh, all integers in the interval one up to n. And then expanding out this and swapping the order of summation again gives me an upper bound of essentially uh, <clears throat> what I wanted in the lambda. So this is my three line proof of the variant of Chang's lemma. I'm sure this was uh, well known to experts. So I'm not claiming a huge amount of novelty here or anything like that. Um, but now we already have basically all the ingredients to prove an Im improved density increment. So let's just recall where we were and start putting everything together. So um, I'm just going to apply this variant of Chang's lemma, taking my subset lambda of my set of large Fourier coefficients to be the whole set of large Fourier coefficients. And since I'm only looking at rationals with small denominators, essentially this approximate 2k fold additive energy is just the same thing as the uh, 2k fold additive energy. So writing that out in this special case gives me an upper bound for my set of large real coefficients, which is given in terms of my quantity B, which is my definition of large, um, N divided by the sines of A, so that's the density of A, times this uh, k-fold additive energy. I guess I should mention that k here is just any integer that I'm free to choose whenever I like, whatever I like. Um, but what we've seen beforehand was that we'd already seen that B was large and we'd applied our additive energy bound to say that the two k-fold um, additive energy of B is small. And so there's clearly a tension between these statements. Um, the second lemma here is saying that the, uh, the lower bound on the left-hand side, the left-hand side must be large, but the third lemma is saying that the right-hand side must be small. Um, and if we work it out a bit more quantitatively, imagine we're thinking of K as being reasonably large. Uh, the second lemma is saying that the left-hand side is of size about Q to the half B squared, if we ignore log factors. And the third lemma is saying that the additive energy to the power one over two K is of size about Q to the one half times B. So, when I multiply by the extra factor B, uh, the upper bound on the right-hand side, when K is large, so I'm ignoring this density factor, is also of size about Q to the one half B squared. So my second lemma is saying the, the left-hand side is of size at least about Q to the one half B squared. The third lemma is saying that the right-hand side is upper bounded by about Q to the one half B squared. And so the Q to one half B squared factor out and this means that um, at least provided these log factor losses are reasonably small, um, I get a contradiction if this factor eta is small relative to the density of my set. Um, and so in particular, um, I get a, um, <coughs> if there's no density increment of a factor one plus eta squared, then I have this additive energy bound. Uh, but for this additive energy bound to be consistent with the other bounds that I have on this side, I must have that eta is reasonably large in terms of the density of my set, where k is still here, just a parameter that I'm free to choose. And so in particular, if I choose eta to be a little bit smaller than this, um, I must have some density increment of a factor one plus eta squared. So there's a bit of mess of working through all the quantitative 
things about how to choose everything to you balance everything up perfectly. But if I choose my exponent k to be of size about log log of one over the density, and I work out what this means, um, I can ensure that my set A must have a density increment of a factor one plus eta, where eta is of size roughly e to the power minus c times the logarithm of one over a divided by log log one over a. So I've skipped over quite a lot of um, slightly technical balancing parameters and uh, doing a little bit of elementary algebra, but the key point is that I now have these density increments and these density increments are much more efficient than what was um, known previously. So in Sarkozy's original argument, uh, you naturally get density increments which are which are having uh, this factor one plus eta, where eta is um, the original density raised to some fixed power. So you think of it as maybe the original density to the power three. Whereas now, um, when the density is small, um, it is the original density to the power one over log log one over the density. And so it's to a very small constant. And this is where we're getting this improved density increment, which ultimately gives the improvement in the theorem. So <clears throat> just writing it out, which is putting everything, all the lemmas that we have together, together um, as an explicit statement. Um, if I started out with some set, subset of one up to n, which had density that wasn't too small and no square differences, then I can find some n primed, which is not too small compared to n, and some set a primed, which is contained in one up to n primes, that also has no square differences and has increased density, where this increased density is of this shape e to the log one over alpha divided by log log one over alpha. So the key improvement here is this log log one over alpha in the denominator. And then if you just iterate this density increment statement and check what all the parameters give, uh, that gives the final bound that I stated before with my work with Tom, where we've improved a quadruple log in the exponent to a triple log in the exponent. Um, okay, so maybe that's all I wanted to say about the proof of the main result. Uh, maybe I'll pause here to see if there's any questions, uh, but otherwise in the last few minutes, maybe I'll just say a few words about um, proving the additive energy bound for rationals of small denominators. Hello. Um, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering whether um, there would be any point in generalizing your result to, and by the way, thank you. It's a, an excellent presentation. I enjoyed it. Um, case power differences instead of considering square differences, saying, and no case power differences. Uh, yeah, so that's a very natural question, and uh, the original uh, Pint-Steiger Samrady argument was generalized precisely along those lines. So first to cave powers, and then I think to intersective polynomial values, where an uh, intersective polynomial is essentially a polynomial that has a root in every piadic field. Um, and I would expect that um, very similarly, you should be able to generalize my work with Tom to either k powers or to intersected polynomials in roughly the same way. There's an important quantitative uh, point that I guess we're saving a factor q to the one half on the Fourier transform of squares with denominators q. Um, but of course, you can say this q to one half um, essentially, well, you can essentially morally say this q to one half using the Bay bound if you're dealing with uh, more general k powers. You have to be a little bit careful about uh, denominators themselves, k powers and things like that. Um, but I would have thought that our argument should generalize in the same way, although we certainly haven't thought about any of the details. Um, 
But yeah, that's a very natural question and a very natural thing to look at. And oh, thank you. I don't see any obvious obstructions to uh, generalizing in the same way that the Pintz Dikers M lady result was generalized. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, seeing no other questions, uh, I appreciate I'm slightly short on time. I'll just say a couple of words um, about the, uh, how you might go about proving the additive energy bound. So I thought about how to present this and I decided I couldn't come up with a very nice way of going through the key points of the whole proof um, of the additive energy bound. So I hope you'll put up with me instead proving two weaker versions of the result that I think are maybe slightly more intuitive. And once you've seen these two proofs, maybe you'll believe that if you work a little bit harder, you can get the result that I put up there. Um, so I'll start off with proving a very simple energy bound and then I'll prove a simple energy bound. And if you've seen the proof of the very simple energy bound and the simple energy bound, then uh, maybe you'll believe me that you can uh, generalize this in a not too difficult way to a slightly less simple energy bound. Um, so my very simple energy bound uh, is, uh, I just want to consider a set of rationals where all the denominators are distinct and all the denominators say lie between, uh, go up to size of most Q or lie between Q and 2Q. And in this case, I want to claim that um, I get an upper bound for the k-fold additive energy of size Q to the k times some logarithmic factor. So again, if C was the set, if C had a rational of each denominator between Q and 2Q, then uh, this means that the additive energy is very close to the trivial lower bound. And so uh, C would have a lack of additive structure. So we're counting rational solutions uh, where we have A1 uh, over Q1 plus 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 up to AK over QK is equal to AK plus one over QK plus one up to A2K over Q2K. Um, but now, the key observation is that if, say, some power of a prime, p to the j divided q1, then we must have p to the j also dividing qi for some other i not equal to j. Otherwise, the left-hand side, when written as a rational, would, be, would have denominator q to the j and the right-hand side would not have, would be a rational that doesn't have denominator multiple q to the j. Um, and when you work out what that means, that means that the least common multiple of all the denominators that appear, so q1 up to q2k, must divide q1 up to q2k um, with multiplicity two. So the LCM of q1 up to q2k squared must divide q1 up to q2k. And so in particular, the LCM of q1 up to q2k must be uh, quite a lot smaller than you expect. It must be of size at most capital q to the 2k, or maybe two time, two to the k times q to the k. Uh, and so then I can bound the number of choices of my denominators q1 up to q2k by just first choosing a value of the LCM and then uh, choosing 2k different divisors of this LCM, since each of q1 up q2k divides the LCM. And so just plugging this in gives me precisely the um, additive energy bound that I put up in the lemma there. So that's a very simple additive energy bound uh, here, all the denominators were distinct, so I wasn't allowing there to be two rationals with the same denominator. Um, but at least in this case, I'm proving something that's saying that there's a lack of additive structure in the uh, in rationals with small denominators. So hopefully, 
uh, this three line proof of the very simple energy bound is reasonably clear to be proper. Um, in the interest of time, I'll move on to the uh, just a simple energy bound um, where I want to do something slightly more sophisticated. Um, so I'm now going to consider a set of rationals, again, all with distinct denominators of size at most Q. And instead of having a up bound for the k-fold additive energy of size Q to the k times some low order terms, I now want to get an up bound which is of size, uh, the size of my set to the power k times some low order terms. So this is a refinement of the very simple energy bound. And this has a little bit more in common with our actual argument. Um, so this is a little bit technical, but I thought I'd go through it anyway. Um, I want to consider two sets. So D sub L is going to be the set of denominators in my uh, set B, which are a multiple of L. And V sub C are going to be those integers L where I get a, where DL is of size a factor one over C of my whole set. So morally in my head, I might think that if my set B looked random, then the probability that an element in B is a multiple of L should be one over L. And then VC would be um, uh, integers of size C basically. So maybe numbers between uh, C over two and C. Um, <clears throat> and my first observation is that uh, if I sum the size of DL over all possible choices of L, then I can just swap the order of summation. And this is a sum of all denominators in my set of the number of divisors of that denominator. And then just using the divisor bound, I know that this is only slightly, this is bound above by something which is only slightly bigger than the size of my original set. And so if I just look at the contribution from those L's in my set VC, when DL has, is off by a factor C, I see that I get an upper bound, which is consistent with what I imagined beforehand of VC being set of integers of size about C. So this says that VC can't be much bigger than that. And so VC can only be of size about C for any choice of C. Um, so the way I'd like to produce my energy bound now, having established that basic fact about DL and VC, um, is by doing two different bounds. Uh, so I want first, uh, the first bound is going to be based on choosing the QIs in turn um, and using these sets VC. And the second bound, is going to be by choosing some of the GCDs first and then using those to bound the sets. So I need a little bit more notation that's a bit technical. So I want to let QI comma J be the GCD of QI and QJ and Q tilde J to be the LCM of QI comma J for all I less than J. So um, the key point is that if I have a K-fold additive relation um, like the type that I'm trying to count, then QJ must divide the LCM of QIJ for all I not equal to J. And so in particular, QJ divides the product of Q tilde for Q tilde being for I being bigger than equal to J. And conversely, I have that Q tilde J divides QJ for each choice of J. So the Q tildes are roughly uh, determining lots of the GCDs, um, and this is going to put constraints on my QJs. And if I know all the Q tildes, then I know all the QIs. And if I know all the QIs, I know all the Q tildes roughly from divisors. Um, and I just want to concentrate on the case when Q tilde J is in the set VCJ for some choice of C1 up to C2K. So I'm going to produce two bounds that are good in two different regimes. The first bound is going to be good when my choice of C1 up to C2K are uh, all large. And 
The fact that the CI are large means that there are few choices of QI if I know what Q tilde I is. So by bound here, first of all, I'm going to choose Q1 and there's the size of my set choices of Q1. Then I'm going to choose Q2 tilde and I know that this is a divisor of Q1, so I can just use the divisor bound to say that there's Q to the little o1 choices of Q2 tilde. But I'm only considering Q2 tilde in VC2, which means that, and I know that Q2 must be a multiple of Q2 tilde. Was there a question? Uh, okay. Um, I know that Q2 is a multiple of Q2 tilde. And so when Q2 tilde lies in B, C2, there can only be B over C2 choices of Q2, given Q2 tilde. So I can then choose Q2, and then I can choose Q2, Q3 tilde, which has to be a divisor of Q1, Q2. Again, just using the divisor bound. But now Q3 has to be a multiple of Q3 tilde. And if Q3 tilde lies in B, C3, then there's only B over C3 choices of Q3. So just continuing this way, choosing Q1, Q2 tilde, Q2, Q3 tilde, Q3, Q4 tilde, Q4, and so on, I get an upper bound, which is the size of B to the power 2K minus one, divided by the product of my CIs times essentially Q to the little o1. So this gives me a good bound. It's a small, it's small when the product of the CIs is large. Uh, in the alternative case, when the product of the CIs is small, I know that there must be very few choices of these QI tildes because V CI is bounded above by essentially size CI. So I can just choose all my Q2 tildes. So I can choose Q2 tilde in BC2. Q3 tilde in BC3, um, up to Q2K minus one tilde in V2K minus one. And the total number of choices of this um, is essentially the product of the CIs, just from the, the size bound on each of the sets VC. Uh, I can then choose Q2K easily. And once I have Q2K and all the QI tildes, I can just Q, choose Q1, Q2, up to Q2K minus one as divisors of the product of these Q2, QJ tildes. So there's some divisor bound for the number of choices of those. And so if I put all of this together, um, the total number of choices is essentially the product of the CIs. And so this gives a good bound when the product of the CIs is small and if you're looking at the worst case scenario that I get a, only a moderate bound in either the first bound or the second bound when the product of the CIs is of moderate size, um, that worst case scenario gives me precisely the bound that I claimed for the simple en energy bound. So um, our actual proof is a sort of generalization of this idea. Um, and it's important you're able to uh, switch perspectives about um, which devices are popular and which devices are not popular. Um, and we find it more convenient to write it in a graph theoretic language. Um, but maybe that's all I wanted to say about this part of the argument. And I'm sorry I've gone slightly over time, but maybe I'll uh, pass over to questions. Thanks a lot for listening. I hope you enjoyed the talk.